degree in Western Europe, and we knew the symptoms. So when we started hearing symptoms in America, we immediately saw what that meant. Scott, you were right. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank, Thank you. you again. Here's the forum now. Hello, everyone. Take your seats for our final session of the day. Um, if you have just joined us, maybe you've just flown in from somewhere to get here for this final session. Um, for those of you who've been all day, I'm going to repeat myself. Uh, if you haven't yet downloaded the IBC app, make sure you do. Uh, it is on your app store. Just look for IBC 2018. It's where you can get involved in all the sessions, be that asking questions, leave comments, rate the sessions as well. So please do get involved by doing that or access it online uh, at Slido. Uh, and please feel free as well on social media if you are taking pictures, you're commenting, you're using quotes or just commenting on the experience, then please use the hashtag. IBC 2018. Now for the finale of the opening day of IBC 2018, rounding off an amazing collection of talks from some of the world's leading media names. Uh, thanks to everybody involved today who has kicked off IBC 2018 this morning. Tim Davies from BBC Studios through to um, Lindsay Patterson, Chief Transformation Officer from Group M and WPP, right through to that last session, which was utterly fascinating about news and the future of news. Um, joining us now then, AI researcher, director of the project on AI and neuroscience in media at the Entertainment Technology Centre at USC and founder and CEO of startup Corto AI, Eve Barkvist, uh, will reveal how he's using AI to uncover the cognitive relationship between audiences and media content. Uh, and chairing your session is Marianne Halford. Enjoy your final session of the day. Okay, so this is, I know what you're thinking, not this guy again. This is water, why is this water? <laughs> okay, um, good evening. My name is uh, Eve Burquist. Um, uh, I'm extremely privileged to be here. Thank you very, very much for uh, IBC for inviting me. I'm also extremely privileged to work with some of the best minds in the world at solving one of the greatest problems in the world, which is human level intelligence. Um, I um, manage a project at the Entertainment Technology Center at the University of Southern California that is uh, supported by um, about a, uh, 15 members, including um, all the studios and, and a bunch of big tech companies. And uh, we build AI machine learning systems for the media industry. Um, I've also uh, worked in private sector quite a bit. Um, this is a hedge fund that we built that have, doesn't have any humans in it, but I worked a lot with um, sports teams, banks, uh, the US government, uh, uh, intelligence agencies, building some fairly high-end AI systems. Um, Lately, I've spun off a lot of research I've done with uh, ETC in a startup called Cordo, uh, and we're basically making the tools that Netflix built available for everybody else, and some of them that even Netflix doesn't have. So, what is AI? A uh, big question. 99.9% um, .9 of, of what you've been told is AI actually really is not AI, as I'm sure you've, um, you've suspected. Um, the, um, I've looked through dozens of definitions of AI, and this is the best one, right? Um, AI is the design of optimal behavior of agents in known or unknown computable environment. That's not the easiest one, but it's the most accurate one. And the key word here is agency, right? Um, you can build content classification um, applications, you know, using neural networks, you know, differentiating between dogs and cats, that's cool, it's really hard, it's not AI, right? Uh, and this is kind of, uh, this one was, was uh, by Shane Legg, who's one of the founders of, of DeepMind, who's one of the top AI experts in the world. Um, so, a lot of what you hear is called AI, actually is, is, is machine learning. Um, for better or for worse, the entire artificial intelligence field has been taken over by computer scientists, and computer scientists have a very narrow vision of intelligence. For them, it's learning. And 
Uh, for us statisticians and cognitive scientists, it is not. And for all of you, as you can imagine, intelligence is far more than learning. So machine learning really uh, uh, is all about learning, as its name implies. AI has a lot more to it. Um, to simplify, really, it's the combination of representing reasoning and learning. And representing really is very important. Uh, knowledge representation is a really big area of AI that's not very well done or very well studied, but it's very, very important. There's a lot of stuff that we do is knowledge representation. The ability to map the world, to really understand the world as it is and all the entities in the world. And agency is the key word, right? The difference between a machine learning application and uh, the main difference between a machine learning application and, and an AI application is the ability to act in their environment, to act as autonomous agents in their environment. So a self-driving car is an AI application. Um, a game-playing uh, application, machine application, is an AI application. A you know, neural network classifier is not an AI application. It's very, there's very, very, very few AI applications. Why? Because it's really, really hard. Um, So this is um, uh, something that came out in a textbook about deep learning. Um, it's a representation of the difference between deep learning, machine learning, and, um, and AI. So if you see deep learning is a subset of representation learning, uh, which is a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. And so you know, this is kind of an important uh, slide because it's really putting deep learning, machine learning, and AI in, in, in the context of what it is. Deep learning is just a section of machine learning. Machine learning is just a section of artificial intelligence. Um, and you can summarize the fields that um, compose AI in this diagram. And you can see this four step field, about 12, um, 12 different areas of, of AI. Machine, of which machine learning is, is just one area. However, machine learning really pervades a lot of the other areas, but there's just far more to AI than just machine learning, and just remember that. 99% of the time when you're, told, when you're being told someone that something is AI, you're being lied to by marketers, usually, or computer scientists. Um, okay, two kinds of AI. Narrow AI is an, is an application that operates at or above human level in one specific domain, but is not transferable to other domains. So you can't take a self-driving car and make it trade stocks or even drive a motorcycle, for that matter. You have to rebuild a completely different, or, uh, different um, application. Um, when DeepMind built AlphaGo in 2016, uh, AlphaGo was trained on a 19 by 19 Go board. If the board had been of a different size, they would have needed to rebuild the entire application. Um, artificial general intelligence, on the other hand, which is what my team and I are working on, um, is one application that can generalize across domains, just like the human mind can trade stocks and learn languages and drive a car. AGI applications should be transferable across domain, and obviously, we're not there yet. Um, um, it's very, very difficult, but this is really something that we're working at. Okay, so this is a, uh, if you want to read more about it, I'm about to publish uh, 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 a report about AI and media and ent entertainment um, in about a couple weeks. You can find it off of the, um, the ETC website. Uh, it'll go into a lot of details about what I'm going to present today. So, knowledge. Part of the reason why AI is so important and so profound and such a profound revolution is because it's a revolution in knowledge. See, the human mind is not actually really that great at knowing things. We're good, we're good, good enough to survive, right? But we're not great at it. And the reason is we live in an extraordinarily complex environment, an extraordinarily complex reality that's a system. It's a system of systems. A cell is a system. Uh, an organ is a system of systems. A body is a system of systems of systems. This room is about, I should just keep going on, like systems of systems of systems of systems. Uh, it'd be really boring, it'd be awesome. Um, but you see what I mean, right? So, and the human mind isn't able to, to represent the world in its full complexity. And what we do is we have this compression mechanism in our brain, and this compression mechanism is the reason why we survived through all these hundreds of thousands of years. And this mechanism allows us to take that complexity and compress it into 
an explanation, a, a, a behavioral script that is going to guide our behavior. And that process is called narrative. Everything's a story. Your car's a story. Your tie's a story. Your wife is a story. Your job's a story. Everything's a story. And stories is both an, an, an output and, and a process. This is the process of boiling down, compressing the enormous complexity of the world that we live in in a set of behavioral steps. A story is a set of steps to solve a problem. And guess what else is a set of steps to solve a problem? A software algorithm. And it's, you know, it's called scripting for a reason, right? So Silicon Valley and Hollywood are in the exact same business, algorithms. And what we do at ETC, a lot of what we do is focused on how do we categorize and classify those algorithms and how do we understand them and understand what kind of impact they have on the human mind. We're really trying to get to the bottom of that cognitive relationship between audiences and content, and I'm going to show you some examples. Um, you don't believe me? Imagine a new color, right? We can't imagine a new color. The human mind isn't capable of processing this level of complexity. And um, to help us, and it's, again, right, complexity is the, is the enemy of everything, and the ability to represent a system in its full complexity is really the ability to represent the actuarial truth, the mathematical truth of the universe and the world and the reality that we live in. And we're not good at that. But machines are really good at that. And the human-machine connection is actually showing a lot of promise today to help us really get to that actuarial truth. This is a really important guy, Jerry Tesoro, IBM, in 1992 created a backgammon playing application that played above human level. Very early on, shallow neural network, one of the first examples of, of, of one of the first applications of neural nets to games. Well, not only did it beat the best human player at the time, it played in a way that was weird, that was just completely unusual to the human mind, and it completely revolutionized the way backgammon had played today. Machines were able to access a mathematical reality that wasn't available to the human mind. Fast forward to 2016. DeepMind built AlphaGo. AlphaGo beat uh, one of the world's top players of Go in three out of four games. The same thing happened. A lot of the moves that AlphaGo made didn't make any sense to the Go players assembled in the room. And AlphaGo completely transformed the way Go is played by human players today. It was able to access a mathematical reality that was not accessible. And Go, by the way, is extremely complex, is that it's got 10 to the power of, of 100 board positions, so it is one of the most complex uh, state spaces of, uh, ever invented. It's got more board positions than there are atoms in the universe. So it's a very, very, very special thing that an AI was able to dominate that level of complexity. To fast forward to 2016, OpenAI created an application uh, called OpenAI 5, which beat one of the top teams of a game called um, Dota 2, which has also a lot of complexity, and also played the game in ways that didn't make any sense to the human teams that were playing it, right? You, you get the idea. The idea is, if we augment ourselves with AI, not only do we make decisions that are based more in the actuarial truth, it changes the way we know things. It changes the way we know the world. And I'm personally really excited about this because what happens when we know things like cancer better or, or what happens when we throw a million variables at understanding poverty or racism? Like this, this is really cool. This is the world that we're heading into. Don't listen to Elon Musk. It's really, really going to happen. It's really, really amazing. Um, as I said, AI is very profound. It's a revolution in knowledge. There's, there's Philosophy tells us there's two kinds of knowledge, of which I added another kind. This is the privilege of doing what I do. I just get to make up new kinds of knowledge. Um, declarative knowledge is facts. Paris is the capital of France. Um, machines are much better at that than we are. Um, so the entire education system is broken. All of our kids are just wasting their time. Um, Machines are better than humans in that, and every job that is based on declarative knowledge, such as you know, accounting or, or, or lawyers, <laughs> sorry, 
However, humans are much better than machines at something called procedural knowledge. How do we make things? How do we, make, how do we create a bicycle? How do we fly a plane? All these how-tos is called procedural knowledge. Machines are pretty good at it, but humans are better than them. And so all of the skills are really going to be transferred from declarative knowledge to procedural knowledge. And then there's a higher level of knowledge, which I call institutional knowledge, narrative knowledge, which is what kind of narrative do we create now that we know that we need, this is how we can go from A to B, what kind of organizations do we create to get there? What kind of narrative do we create to collaborate, to work on something, to build something, to sell something, to change something? And that is something that is far outside of the machine capability right now. So, and humans are very good at it, as we know. Um, this is going to change a lot of things, including how our organizations are, are uh, structured, right? So the matrix model, as we all know, because we all work in matrix organizations, is completely broken. It's for a different age. We're heading into an organization model, which we call Borg orgs, because they're cyborgs. They're half man, half machine. We're heading in an organization where men and machines are going to collaborate on more fluid projects, and where management, instead of being on top of everything, it's kind of a a uh, uh, facilitator around everything, right? And it's all based on a, on a knowledge representation, semantic knowledge store, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we're going from silos to systems, from markets to ecosystems, right? So this is, you know, right now, the insight function inside of a media company are, you know, really broken in different silos. You have the content insights people, uh, you have the performance people, you have the... Uh, uh, you have the audience intelligence people. Well, we all, what we're doing at, at, at ETC and at Cord is we're throwing all this stuff in the same database, right, in the same graph, and we're trying to understand well, what are the relationships between all these things. And that's very, very uh, disruptive. So, you know, when you go to linear, from linear to semantic knowledge, a lot of really, really cool things happen. You're able to connect very specific attributes of content with conversations about the content, emotions about the content, and performance. Again, it's the idea that we're really trying to, to, to hack that cognitive relationship between stories and behavior. And so we're heading from the world where we're really looking at Steve and Sally as discrete you know, persons and to a world where we're going to be able to extract every possible genomic type insight about them and about the content they're watching and really trying to really understand what kind of emotional journeys they're, they're, they're into, what kind of music tonalities they're into. And I've, I'll show some examples. We're doing some very, very concrete things with that. So doing, building that capability is what Corto AI is doing. Corto AI has different components. We throw all the data into a semantic knowledge store, which is based on weight labeled hypergraph. The, Interest there is that hypergraphs are actually the structure of the, the mathematical structure of the reality that we know it. A hypergraph is a form of graph where an entire graph can be a node. And this is exactly, exactly how the world is organized. This is exactly how the universe is organized. And there's a lot of value, we think, in representing the world the way it's actually really organized. Then we throw all of this into, um, we apply different machine learning and AI plugins to it, and it's all outputted in the natural language interface where you literally can ask questions to your data and get answers. Um, so the knowledge representation is, is a, based on hypergraph. The, uh, it's all wrapped in a uh, evolutionary meta learning engine, which essentially is an AI application that breeds a bunch of AI algorithms together to create more performing AI. So it's sort of self-optimizing AI applied to producing better AI. But what can go wrong? Um, this is the application. This is how we're applying to the media and entertainment industry. We're just throwing everything in it. And literally, weather, US census, ratings, box office returns, songs, the waveform of the song itself, scripts, hundreds of scripts. And then we're connecting all these dots, trying to figure out what, what actually drives performance. So this is a very uh, a concrete case study. Um, we call this story cipher. So we've been able to classify content um, in an ontology of narrative structures. We know that 
A story can either be about this, 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 or this. We have, there's just a finite space of things that a story can be about or a character can be about. This is a graph that is showing um, what kind of narrative attributes at the beginning of a film do better at the box office. So if your movie at the beginning is about becoming or doing or learning, and there's some kind of fast forward or flashback into it, you're gonna do a lot better than if it's about conscious memory or preconscious. And these are really important because the data told us something that we actually already knew, which is amazing if you're a data scientist and you love that stuff. You don't want the data to tell you something that is completely counterintuitive. You want the data to tell you something, half of it is really intuitive and half of it is new. Conscious memory and preconscious are what we call internal states. It's when, whenever the, um, the action in a movie happens inside a character, the, the movie doesn't very do, do very well, which is why theater, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a theater structure and not a film structure because it's not very visual in nature. So we've done a big study on that. It's coming out probably in a few months. Uh, you all uh, be invited to it. Um, we have developed a natural language processing application that is parsing uh, content scripts uh, across 60 different dimensions of emotional tonality. Um, this is much more granular than positive, negative, neutral sentiment. This is really, this is what, this is the emotional journey present in, this is emotional tonality present in that scene. And we can do a lot of really cool things with it. For example, um, we can map how every single emotion is represented in a film and we can find out, and this is scary accurate, by the way. We can really find out, we can really map the emotional journeys of each character in every scene, which, and it's outputting numerical values, which we then can use to correlate against other numerical values, such as TV ratings or box office returns. So this is something that we did. We looked at the scripts and the TV ratings of a... Uh, a drama thriller series, which I can't name. But we noticed that that series really dropped dramatically in season two. And we noticed there was a very, very close correlation between the ratings dropping and the main character having these new emotional attributes to him. The character was, you know, was very dark in season one, and then in season two started becoming a lot more extroverted, a lot more energetic, and a lot more cheerful. And this really, really explained why the ratings drops in, in season two. All right, this is pretty unique. Nobody has done this before, I think. This is entirely machine-driven, by the way. This is what Cordo does. Uh, we also can map the viral pathways. So why does a, why does a, a, a TV show or, or a film become really big? This was for an uh, adult animated series looking at Reddits and subreddits, and we can really point out which communities are very instrumental in driving buzz in a way that gets the show in the mainstream. We can do that on Reddit, Tumblr, Twitter, across all social media. Again, this is a notion that when you throw a very granular view of audience conversations together with the attributes of content, together with performance results, a lot of magic happens. You really see what kind of content attributes resonate in what way with what kind of audience segments and are they influential or not, and how is that driving your performance. So we build a very, very granular view of audiences and, and again, that cognitive relationship with content. Next year, we'll put people in fMRI machines and measure their brain activity. Well, that's a different thing. And when that happens, it's game over, because when we can infer what kind of emotional resonance a character, a narrative arc has, then it's over. There's, there's no more level of granularity that we can measure things in. And it's going to happen. Something else that we did based on the, uh, uh, looking at, at uh, Reddit, uh, the viral pathways, which how influential are the communities on one another, right? the subreddit. So you can see the, the American Horror Story is a 0.69% correlation with the psych community. So those two communities on Reddit will be heavily influential on each other. And you sort of map the entire landscape of music, TV, film, brands to this and find out which communities do I need to hit with my marketing and why do they ex what's going to make them excited? Why are they going to be excited? What do I need to show them to get them excited? And how do I know that they're excited? So we, we, we really, really boil that down to, to a mathematical level. We even have a formula that explains why everything's interesting. People, characters, films, books. In everything that we find interesting, there's a, a, 
a similar ratio of attributes about that thing that are known, that are traditionally associated with that thing, and attributes that are new. If all the attributes of something are in the known domain, it's boring. If all the attributes of something are in the um, novelty domain, it's overwhelming. We're not, we're not able to represent it. And if you look at everything that works, Deadpool, all the Pixar movies, they all songs, every single popular song has this ideal ratio of attributes of known to attributes that are unknown. Novelty being one of the biggest drivers in the brain. It's not something that people in the media really industry really understand, but if you look at the neuroscience of it, it's massively powerful. Um, we build a lot of character graphs. We look at the intensity of conversations about the relationship between two characters versus the intensity of the actual relationship between these two characters per the script. And that can give us an, a, an idea of, hey, how do we, um, you know, how do we develop two, two, um, uh, two characters? So this is for the show Psych. You know, we're able to see that Karen, like a lot of... Um, uh, conversations were around Karen and Sean, and they, and they wanted them to hook up, but, but the writers of Psych didn't really uh, go that way. And so we can spot the differences between what the creative has decided for the characters and what the, uh, the audience uh, wants for the characters. Uh, we did a big uh, feature film study of 647 feature films looking at what are the dominant traits, what are the dominant emotional journeys in feature films. Well, you see a lot of uh, really negative traits like type A, neuroticism, stress, anxious, body for melancholy, insecure, artistic. Why? Because conflict, neuroticism, is really what fiction is about, film fiction is about. However, if you plot, if you start layering box office returns into it, you see a completely different story. Story is, oh, the traits that are actually making a lot more money at the box office are actually a lot more uh, generally uh, positive, right? Workhorse, independent, beautiful, humble, happy, Social skills, conscientious, organized, genuine, friendly. Um, so maybe Hollywood is missing some opportunities there. I don't know. Um, this is another cool thing that we just finished. Uh, we can plot the affinities in every single zip code in America. You give us a zip code, we tell you what the people in that zip code uh, uh, really care about. And uh, we, uh, um, for one of the ETC members that wanted to promote a documentary, we showed them exactly which communities were the most likely to really resonate with that documentary and the, and the, and the narrative structures in it and the characters in it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can show them where they need to, to, um, uh, to distribute it. Um, these are the communities, among the communities that are gonna resonate, that are the most influential, that are going to be more influential in converting people that are not in that affinities domain, but on the fence about it in going to, to watch this documentary. Um, and we can even um, tell them the probability of attendance between a certain zip code, the radius around a zip code based on weather, traffic, dem demographics, attributes, strength of the affinity. We can predict what is the probability that people are actually going to drive to the theater to go watch uh, that documentary based on a whole source of extraneous factor. Again, there's magic in throwing all this data together. Throw all the data into it and look at the connections. That's what we're doing. And we can also um, tell them what optimal ticket price to, uh, to charge people. Um, we're also working in the music industry. We're working for a big music publisher right now. Uh, we've built this application which looks at, again, on the left, intrinsic attributes of the content, conversation about the content in the middle, and news, and then, you know, some weird stuff like US Census and weather and traffic and, and obviously Spotify data because it's what, it's, the, it's what performance is measured against. And we found some, and you know, it's all wrapped in the probabilistic reasoning that I, uh, that I mentioned. And we found some really cool things, actually. Um, okay, so this is cool. On the left here, you see a representation of the various pitches the various tonalities of the songs that, that we've analyzed. We've analyzed the songs together with the conversations about the song. And just the tonality of the song explains 34, 33, one third, roughly, of the variance of Spotify performance, which is amazing. If you think about it, one attribute of a song explains one third of the performance of that song on Spotify. That's pretty unusual, that's pretty amazing. But not only that, we, we showed that specific tonalities generate specific dimensions of emotional tonality in the conversation about the song. 
So we've tapped on something really, really cognitive. Certain tones in a song are going to determine the emotional tonality of the conversations about the song, and we can tell uh, the music publisher how that drives their, their performance on Spotify, which is really new. This has never been done before. And again, we're really trying to hone in on that cognitive layer. Um, lastly, we're building this, which is a content classification uh, application that is going to extract every single attribute of content, whether it's music, color, composition, edit pace, um, <coughs> uh, white balance, and represent it numerically. And the idea is if we create a semantic numerical representation of all the attributes in every frame of every piece of content, we can start doing some really, really cool things, connecting the dots and, and trying to answer questions like, hey, what is the meaning of green? in this context? What is the meaning of a drop cut in this context? What is the meaning of this kind of emotional tonality in the song in the context of that scene? Like we can really start answering these questions. Um, so to finish, I want to talk about medicine. Um, the way medicine is, is organized is completely horrible. It's, it's basically um, you know, a very mechanistic view of knowledge. It's, it's a reflection of that completely limited capability to really understand the world the way it is. So, you know, if you're a doctor, you're an eye doctor, or you're a foot doctor, that's not how the body works. This is how the body works. It's a system, right? And just like systems medicine and systems biology has revolutionized medicine and biology, we think that systems media is going to revolutionize media. What happens when we throw all of this data across advertising, gaming, TV, film, everything. How, what happens when we throw all this stuff in a semantic representation where we apply some AI algorithms to it? A lot of really cool things happen. And we think that we're standing on the cusp of a massive revolution in how stories are being told and how stories resonate with people. And we think we're standing on the cusp of an explosion in value in media companies. Your companies are going to be orders of magnitude more influential than they are and more powerful and more, and more financially successful than they are today. Because Story, they know how to tell stories, and with this, they're going to tell stories right. And when stories are right, it's going to take over the world. Thank you. You okay? Yeah, I'm great. So, Eve, thank you for a great presentation. That was, that was fascinating. So, um, in one of the sessions I was at today, um, the, uh, the, the speakers were talking about the need for uh, local broadcasters to embrace aggregation in their local communities. Can, the story, can these types of things be applied to storytelling on what different... What does aggregation mean? Well, aggregate amongst the different broadcasters in a particular market oh. so that they can wind up building systems that yeah. can compete against the Netflixes and the Got others. It. Um, so going more niche, that you are going to have several large global yeah. players, but can this type of thinking work in local markets oh, as well? Yeah. Okay. I mean, um, it's really about how powerful your stories are, right? Um, if you think about the advertising market, especially technology in the advertising market, it's it's kind of pathetic. Like you're, you, advertisers spend so much money trying to optimize the ramming of stories that people don't want to hear down their throats. Mm -hmm. We'll start with telling better stories, Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at when Nike starts telling a very compelling story. Look what happens, right? Um, I think, really, it's all about telling the stories that really resonate with people, that drive not only affinity, but positive change. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's really what this whole thing is about for me. And, and how, how does your system break down the scripts? I was, I was so scripts are great from a machine perspective because they're all formatted in, in roughly the same way. You know, mm -hmm. when, when Jesse talks, you know, you have the name Jesse, you know, right above the dialogue box. So a machine can say, oh, okay, well, Jesse is talking. So just classify this dialogue as Jesse. It would be significantly more, more complex for a novel, for example. Um, it's just scripts are, machines love script. And, um, you know, there's just a lot of... Um, libraries and repositories behind it that look at what kind of words are used and what kind of combination to infer what kind of emotional tonality is present in that text. 
Okay, interesting. So you said that everything is a story. What's the story of the creative executives responding to this at this point in time? Um, it varies, actually. It varies uh, generationally. Um, the younger ones tend to totally get this and be really excited about it because they really understand that this could allow them to um, create more compelling stories and have the people who, who calculate risk about those stories use better risk models mm -hmm. to evaluate that creativity. Um, you know, the entire media industry, including advertising, especially advertising and marketing, is really suffering from just really bad risk models. If you think about the risk models of film or TV or, or, or advertising is even worse, they're horrible. It's like you average all the box office that Tom Cruise has generated in the past 15 years. That's not how the world works. This is really stupid. And so a lot of stories, so we realize a lot of stories aren't being told that need to be told. Um, you know, and, and a lot of creators really understand that. And, and the older ones really hate this because they think it's going to revert to the mean and then we're going to create formulas, and then every single movie or TV show are going to be in the same formula. They don't really understand the novelty element of it. Like everything that we do for the media industry is aimed at, at maximizing this ratio of attributes that are known and need to be there, and then everywhere else, go nuts. Like you, be, you should be as creative as possible. Um, there's a huge crisis of this in the media industry. And if you look at all the drama around Star Wars, I don't know anything about it, but. I think it's related to how much innovation can be built on the traditional Star Wars canon. Like, where do you innovate in Star Wars, which at this point is really a religion, right? So where do you innovate, where do you stick to the canon um, is, is a huge challenge, right? If you don't innovate enough, meh, not interesting, right? If you innovate too much, then you're going to antagonize the fan base. So this ability to extract attributes about the story, the narrative that really, really need to be there for people to be able to represent it as a Star Wars movie and attributes that are new um, is a huge challenge. I think at the end of the day, everything's going to be pinned to that. Interesting. So have you begun to work with any creative executives in Hollywood or creative, uh, more so, not creative executives, really more creative storytellers in terms of taking this type of thinking and the processes that you're building. Have you begun to experiment with any of them? No, I don't think we're ready. To you're not ready yet. Okay. Um, and they're not ready for sure, but we're not ready to. Um, <laughs> um, I think next year is gonna be key is we're gonna roll out a lot of these systems okay. as products next year. And as we're, sh we don't really have a lot of things to show them. We have a lot of R and D. Right. It was, you know, it's cool, but you know, come back with something that I can buy or license or that I can use. And as we're as we're spinning that off in actual products in a few months, I think we're gonna meet a lot of resistance <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of enthusiasm. And it's just how it is. Like that's just how how when you introduce a new idea, you get a lot of resistance and a lot of and a lot of enthusiasm. And it's fine. We're, I'm happy to to explain to people that it's not a threat. It's going to empower them as creative. But if you think about it. You know, I want to push creatives to be more creative. And that's a kind of a scary challenge for us as a creator. Like, no, 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 be more creative. If you've written anything, that's, that's a huge pressure. Like, how do you do that? And so there's, there's kind of a, a lot of hand-holding, I think, is going to happen. Although there are creative, there are people that are intuitively incredibly creative that can take things and then turn them into something completely different and interesting. Like, just a, last week, I, I finally watched Get Out, um, which took the horror film genre and completely turned it on its head. Um, Not completely turned it on its head. That's a really interesting example. Mm -hmm. Get Out has some, again, a lot of horror canons in Get Out and a lot of novelty on top of it. Yeah. Get Out is, is, is perfect, it, just like every single Pixar movie, is in that perfect ratio of attributes of the horror film that are very traditionally associated with a horror film and a lot of novelty on top of it. So I want more Get Outs to be made. Okay, so you, your feeling is is that once you've developed the system and, and gotten it going more so within the creative community, that that, that type of storytelling will become more abundant within the, within the industry. Yes. The, okay, so, so the, creative exe the creative executives are one issue. What about um, uh, getting 
the business, the overall infrastructure of Hollywood and large media and entertainment companies, which by the way are a little challenged these days, um, how do you wind up taking your way of thinking and get them to, to embrace it from a business model point of view? And do you think because the industry is challenged right now, there is this is actually a really interesting time to be introducing this kind of thinking? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a big challenge for us because as we're rolling out a completely new product, we, we have no idea whether people are going to embrace it or not. I think, I think there's magic in building something and making it available to people because then they can use it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If there's nothing to use, they can, they can, it's easier to be stuck in your old ways when there isn't something new that is out there that you could use mm -hmm. to challenge those old assumptions. When something is out there, and people start using it, right? It's kind of like nuclear weapons in the Middle East. Nobody wants to be the first one, nobody wants to be the last one. So I think you'll have a few um, leaders, <coughs> Warner Brothers, <coughs> that are going to uh, probably use it, and you'll have, then, then it's gonna be more successful, mm -hmm. and, then, and then people will, um, people will, will eventually embrace it, right? It, it's, nobody wants to be the only one that's not using something that could make them more successful, right? Nobody wants to be the first one, mm -hmm. and nobody wants to be the last one. So I think if, it may take a little bit longer than we thought, although really there's a lot of that can be applied to very, right now to marketing and distribution and, and, and decisions that are hundreds of billions of dollars, right? Um, so I think we're entering through the marketing and ad, the marketing and distribution mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 business unit, and then people in other business unit will learn how to use it. And we've built a lot of very very addictive loops in in the app itself. It's really fun to use. It's really you know it's, it's so it's a SaaS platform. I it's a SaaS platform. Yeah. It's it's natural language. It's very playful. It's very uh, ambient, right? Mm -hmm. It's not in your face. It really sends you the information that you need, where you need it, when you need it. So it's cool from that standpoint. It's really like we've we've put a lot of emphasis on pleasure, like having pleasure in using it and enjoying it. And so we're hoping that this is going to help. Okay. Well, hopefully you'll be able to come back here next year and or two years from now at least and tell us how well you're doing with it. If I'm dead, they've assessed <laughs> it. I just want to make it well, clear. Well, I know that a number of the uh, members of the audience had uh, some, some questions, so um, I'm going to uh, throw some of them at you. Um, how relevant is your media, how relevant is a media content algorithm to other parts of the world other than the U.S.? Uh, actually, that's a really good question. Um, we've done um, a lot of analysis. So we collect a lot of audience data in China, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and we've done some analysis across these markets, and we found a lot of similarity. Because I think at the end of the day, there is something about narrative that just speaks to the human mind, period. It's, mm -hmm. We may have different cultures. We have the same brain structure. And then, sure, there's a lot of cultural variance, but, you know, um, there are themes that are across culture, and we really, we're, we're really taking a very cognitive approach to it. Mm -hmm. So while we try to control for culture as much as possible, um, we've noticed we were surprised that culture wasn't as much a factor as we expected it to be. There was a lot of, we saw a lot of the same things across cultures. Mm -hmm. And obviously the system is going to be open to many different languages, correct? correct. Yeah, yeah, okay. we're, so, we're yeah. Collecting we're going to build the very, very first platform focused on uh, media audience insights in China. Oh, wow. That's got to be interesting, breaking all that down, mm -hmm. given the language there. Okay. Um, what is the biggest thing, uh, AI, uh, what are the biggest things that we could ha see happening in broadcast, because this is a broadcasting conference, um, as a result of AI and applying some of your thinking here? You know, if I, if I just take the market as it is and I sort of project the market, market trends and tech trends, I see opportunities to, for extreme personalization based on certain attributes of content. For example, if you know that I would resonate with a higher contrast mm -hmm. or just simply, you know, a lot of people, most people's TVs are set wrong. So you spend so much money making sure that you, your, your film or, or your show has the right color scheme, the right white balance, and then it's all screwed up by someone's TV who's never really changed the factory settings. So that, I think, um, from a creative standpoint, that I think will, will change for the better. I think I really believe in 
extreme personalization. Mm -hmm. Literally send people some color schemes that they're gonna resonate more or, or even story attributes that are gonna resonate more with them. Um, I also believe that we're going to be bathed in 24 seven immersive narrative, right? Narrative across advertising, marketing, TV, film, narrative at the level of a city, right? So it's something that we're working on at ETC. Is like, what is, how does the story work? How do we leverage the IoT ecosystem, the smart cities ecosystem, to tell a story at the scale of a city? So it's like in your face, in your life, everywhere is a story. And you could probably spend your life in the Star Wars story. Um, if you think about the media properties that are the most successful, whether it's Star Wars or Marvel or Hannity or Maddow, um, they all have one thing in common, is you can spend, they're very... I don't know if everybody in this audience knows who Hannity and Maddow are, though. Well, I'm... <laughs> check them out. Don't check them out. Sean Hannity is one of, one of our president's uh, uh, favorite journalists, so... <laughs> don't check them out. Marvel and Star Wars, you probably yes. all know this. Um, are extremely structured whole universes that are really complete. You can literally spend your whole life in Star Wars, in Marvel. Mm -hmm. It's a complete story that has answers, just like a religion, by the way, that has answers for almost everything. And the most successful media properties are gonna be the ones that are whole stories. And we're, we're, helping, we're helping them do that. Well, given that the Disney organization is going to be investing a lot in the Star Wars franchise over the next five years, hopefully they'll be listening to you in terms of uh, where they go with it all. I think, do we have time for one more question? I think so. I'm going to shoot one more at you. Um, could you put together a package for a studio now with a script, casting, and promise them it would be a box office success? Yes and no. We could put together a package that is optimized for success. Mm -hmm. um, promise. I, I have I have issue with the word promise. Mm -hmm. um, we could tell the studio not to produce something to produce something at a, at a price point that is more in tune with, with the return. So there was a okay. famous example of a sci-fi sequel that sort of underperformed, and we went back on the data, I looked at the conversation data, and, and it was very clear that whoever had decided to put that movie in production had assumed that it was a very mainstream property, but if you looked at the social media data, you would have seen very, very clearly that there was a very, very passionate fan base, but in no way, shape, or form big enough to, to have a hit, right? Yeah. And so you have a lot of that. You have a lot of these sci-fi properties that are try, trying to be remade. Um, they're extremely expensive movies, and we're telling a lot of studios right now to not make them because they're, they're, there's not an audience to be, the, the, the audience isn't there to make money on the $250 million movie for that universe. Well, another thing too, you have, a really good quality story, but you may not have a good quality director. Yeah, well, directors are difficult because they really have a, a very, um, it's, it's, it's a little harder to pin them down from a style perspective. Um, but yeah, we're gonna get there. Okay. Well, I think that's it. So um, thank you so much, everybody. I think it's time for cocktails. Seriously. Okay. And uh, maybe a, a story will be emerging around you as you walk through the, uh, the rye here. Thank, thank you so you. much. Marianne and Eve, everyone, thank you very much. Thanks to everybody who Thanks came to Thanks then to Eve Perret and the team in the forum.